as you've been told. I'm very happy to be here today uh, with the team, and I'm happy that uh, this boot camp is happening under the auspices of the HALT Prize, uh, a prize that have really supported students, even in KU, yeah, to actually participate. Yeah, and of course, we know that Kenya has really performed well, even globally. You know, from uh, some of the things we have been told by the judges, even who have done it uh, at the regional and the global level, is that uh, Kenyans put up a very good show. Uh, I always stand by the words that the youth are the promise uh, for the country, and I'm happy when they channel their energies into, you know, coming up with solutions, uh, leveraging on the very good ecosystem that we have in Kenya, and by and large, you know, trying to contribute know their solutions and it is through what they're doing uh, that we are able to see uh, companies we are able to see economic development we are able to see uh, new solutions we are able to see jobs yeah so we really have to support the youth and i'm happy that health prize is happening and i'm happy actually to listen to uh, robert yawe uh, who is really seasoned uh, in matters business matters entrepreneurship uh, and uh, I look forward. So thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm happy to to support uh, this particular session. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank and uh, yeah, uh, so we 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 are going to introduce now the speaker. And uh, Grace, come on, can we have, have get the privilege of introducing our speaker? No problem. Um, our speaker of the day is Mr. Robert Yawe. He is a seasoned public speaker and financial and management expert who has been a mentor and a judge in many startup competitions. He is also the managing director of Synup Tech Solutions Limited, an ICT company dedicated to provide infrastructure visibility. I'd like to give this chance to Dr. Yow uh, Mr. Yawe to introduce himself. Thank uh, good you. afternoon, all. Um, as said, my name is Robert Yawe. Um, I'm fairly active in the startup ecosystem. I mainly coach and, um, and mentor at the Strathmore Incubator, IBIS Africa, as well as the University of Nairobi C4D Lab. I've been involved in the Total uh, Startup Challenge and many others. And uh, my area of concentration or specialization in that is what we call customer development and uh, which I believe is where most of us fail when it comes to setting, starting up businesses. We all begin with products instead of beginning with understanding who the customer is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Makadi? Okay, thanks a lot for that. Uh... Or Dr. Or Buana Robert Yawe, and uh, I'd like to welcome now our our moderator, yeah, Mr. George Candy. Proceed on now. Yeah, the floor is all yours now. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, and uh, I think it's a good time that uh, we introduce and talk about issues to do with uh, before the startup. Uh, the question why. Yeah, so we really need to understand and unpack, you know, this very important question. You know, why are we getting into 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 the startup? Why are we, why are we establishing a startup? And the reason why I think what we want to talk about today is very, very important is sustainability of any business yeah, is based on this particular question. Yeah, so our bootcamp today is very, very key. And I would want uh, all of us to listen to Robert Yawe, uh, who is really seasoned. Uh, yes, I, I've, I've worked with him uh, during uh, the Startup Upper Challenge. I remember we used to do the evaluations and then they used to pick it up, you know, as mentors and also pick some of uh, the companies. So this issue of why is very, very important. And I know our speaker for, for today will take time and unpack it and simply make us understand why the, the word why, you know, in the startup scene is very, very important. So maybe what I can say before I, I, I let him in is, yeah, let's listen to him very, very carefully. Uh, let's concentrate. And if you have any questions, you can start putting them on the chat box. Uh, and when you put them on the chat, 
uh, we will be able to read them at the uh, at the end of of his session yeah but we will also have a q and a session so uh, the the idea why we need people to write questions is just in case you forget yeah or if you don't have a pen and a paper so uh, you don't have to wait for the end yeah but uh, you can simply put them on the chat so allow me to welcome uh, robert yawe uh, you have uh, your time i know you you know the time you have maybe i will raise my hand just in case uh, you you simply take more time than uh, you need uh, and then we will have a q and a so uh, robert uh, over to you you can take up the floor thank you okay thank you very much george um, it's interesting because I'm told the topic is supposed to be why. Normally what I like to say is that all of us are entrepreneurs. And maybe what we should start off with is really what's the definition of entrepreneur. Uh, textbook definition, someone who sets up a business or businesses taking on financial risk in the hope of profit. So when I say all of us are entrepreneurs, what really do I mean? Even as an employee, you're basically selling a skill in exchange for cash, which makes you an entrepreneur. And the problem is that we tend to separate these entities and think that the only person who's an entrepreneur is somebody who is out there, I believe what you call hustling. And that's maybe where we are having an issue. Because if we all understood that you're an entrepreneur and then we wouldn't have this problem of a lot of people complaining that you've gone through university and you can't find a job. In other words, you went and picked up a skill which had no market. So the first thing you should really have done before you join the university is find out who needs this skill that I'm acquiring and what's the demand for it and how much are they willing to pay for it? So if you think of the course you're doing and you ask yourself, how many other people across the 50, I believe it's 52 universities or something, are doing exactly the same course? When was the last time you opened a newspaper and you saw an advert for such a position? If it's never, then maybe you need to ask yourself, should, do I really need to be here doing this? So I like to say that that's the first place where we need to think about it. We are all entrepreneurs and you need to make sure you have somebody who is willing to pay you for what you're trying to to make available to them. Coming to the startup space, it's the same thing. Many people tend to begin with a product, as I said earlier. I walk around and everybody has a product. But every time you ask somebody, what, who exactly have you built this product from? And they go off at a tangent telling me about all the features about the product. And that's a mistake. We have too many products or solutions looking for a problem to solve. The first thing is to make sure a problem does exist. If the problem exists, then begin to look for a solution for that problem. A lot of times we assume that because you can see the problem, the person who has it also knows that they do have a problem. There's one fact that most people don't get is that many of us have different size feet. I believe it's actually almost every single human being. None of us have both feet which are the same size. So if I'm to use the basic of, of how people start their business, then you say that the market size for people with shoes, with feet which are not equal, is 7 billion people. Therefore, that's a huge market. Then you go off and you start giving me a, a business plan about how if 1% of these 7 billion people each bought a shoe from me, this will be the cost. So it is a problem which is big enough. But the question is, how many times have you walked into a shop and asked for size six on the left and size seven on the right? I'm sure never. Which therefore tells you that the person with the problem has already found an easier solution to it. Naturally, what we do is we know which leg we are willing to have suffer while the other one is comfortable. So if one of your feet is a size six and the other is a six and a half, for some people, they'll buy a size six. Others will buy the six and a half. Others will stuff in one of the shoes to make it more comfortable. So basically what you're saying is that that particular problem has already got a solution. And therefore the pro person with that problem is very unlikely to pay you to fix that problem. So if I'm not willing to pay you to fix the problem, stop trying to come up with a solution for it. And that is 90% of us. For those of you 
who are here and in university. I normally say that the most wasted four years is that in universities. Because there's a misconception about why you're there. Some of these programs are being run to get you to appreciate that there's more to being in university than just waiting to stand up wearing a black outfit and receive a piece of paper. If that was all, then this country should be very far ahead because we are graduating more and more people every year. I believe the current intake, you're about 120,000 students who are in the university as first years. But yet look around you. Look at the mediocrity of the country. Look at the mediocrity of everything that goes on. There is no innovation. There's no ingenuity. All we have is people who just want to hawk things. You want to buy maize on this end, sell it at that end. Buy groundnuts on this side, sell it on the other end. Yet, why are you there in the university? And I say basically there are three things here. You'll sit in class and listen to a lecturer who gives you what was. It's historical. This is how things happen. Then you look at that and you ask yourself, what is currently happening in the present? And then you ask yourself, how do I transition the theory of the past into practicality of the present? After that, then you ask yourself, when I finish my fourth year, where am I taking this system to? What's the future of this? Some people will tell you, oh, this only applies for people engineering, guys doing computer science. No, look at law, a dying career. Very soon lawyers will have no work, at least in the way we know a lawyer today. But there are those who are already reinventing themselves. To register a business before, you'd go to a lawyer who would charge you 150,000 shillings. Today, the government charges you 15,000 shillings and you do it all online. So what happened to all those, all those lawyers who spent all their time photocopying or copy, uh, what do you call it? They put them onto the computer and then search and replace company A with company B, print, bind, and charge you 150,000 shillings. That's gone. Yet we are training more and more lawyers to go and do what? We don't know. You look at guys doing computer science. I look at it. Never complain that you're being given obsolete knowledge. What you're being given is the basics. You're being given the basics of computer science. But after that, you need to go and ask yourself, where does this get applied? And I really get sort of pissed off when I hear people saying that, oh, our, our, our students are being half-baked. So what do you mean they're half-baked? Even when you go to driving school, you're never taught how to go get out of mud. You're never taught how to cut, off, cut out a matatu. All that must go and be done practically when you get out into the field. So the same thing is what is expected of you while you're sitting at the university. You listen to the lecturer tell you about the past, you look at where it's applied in the present, and you start planning and strategizing for how that is going to change the future. If you're not changing the future, then really you're not doing anything. So things like the Holt Prize are supposed to be able to help you to think through, what am I going to go out into the world and change? If all you're going to do is to go around, walk around and just keep sending your CV left, right and center, then you've wasted four years. Many of the times people say, no, but I cannot start off until I leave the university. Let me tell you the most comfortable time to innovate is when you're on campus. Why? When you arrive in the university, you actually have received startup funding. You've received your seed capital. Your seed capital is four years with access to lecturers, professors, researchers, fellow students in the thousands. That's what you've been given. You've been given a lab that's enormous for you to go and ask yourself, how will I make a change when I leave this place? Not where will I go and get a job? It's the worst thing you can ever do to yourself. 
and worse still to society. So when you're out there, when you're there in the university, you've got four years. You've been given board, food, an allowance. So what do you do with it? Most of you squander it. Then after four years, you walk out, you tarmac for two years, then you start saying how, oh, the degree I did is not helping me. But from the start, maybe there was nobody who needed that skill. So when you go out, once you've, those four years are supposed to be for you to tell us how you'll change the society when you leave. University students are supposed to be job creators. So when you sit there and you're hoping that somebody else is creating the job for you, then you have a problem. And I'll tell you, this is across the board. Even if you're just doing anthropology, people might laugh at you. But today, some of the best HR managers are people who did anthropology. Because places of work are ecosystems with animals. So your knowledge you acquire, that is why you're told, you're not given, when you graduate, you'll not be told, I give you the power to go and do engineering. I give you the power to read and go and do all that appertains to that degree. Why? The whole idea was the four years were for, to help you broaden your thinking. Because for the years you were in high school, in primary and secondary school, 90% of what you did was learn how to regurgitate other people's ideas. You passed because you were able to reproduce somebody else's ideas. That's what it's about. Now, if you land at the university and you're still trying to do the same thing, to just regurgitate other people's ideas, just repeat what others have said, like, 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 retweet, 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 share, share, share. So your entire lives are becoming about not generating. You can't even, it's become so bad now that you don't even comment on anything. You just share. You go to WhatsApp, all you're seeing people doing is share, share, share. Do you have an input? Do you have anything to say about what that person has posted? If you have nothing to say, then don't forward it because then there's nothing you're adding. And that's what it's all about when you're sitting there for the four years is you're trying to learn how to think, how to break down an issue. Think of all the top companies today and ask yourself, where were they started? Where was Facebook started? On campus. Where was Dell computer started? On campus. Go through Yahoo, you name it, Google. All the companies you're all excited about, you're all talking about emulating, where did they start? They started on campus. Why did they start on campus? Because it's the only time where somebody pays you to do nothing else but think. That is why we're having an issue. So we come down to this. If you're sitting in the university, have you decided what you want to change in society when you leave? The place to experiment is where you are, on campus. When you come out, the world is very harsh. You'll be surprised how today you can call home and you'll be sent money for whatever you want to do. But let me assure you, the day you graduate is the day you'll find out that your parents are not as nice as you thought. Because for them, they have spent, they gave you money for four years. Seed capital. Note, your four years are seed capital. You have four years to build a startup and launch it. On graduation, you should begin scaling that business. Not walking out to start buying reams of paper to go and print copies of your CV. It's scary. I think there's a show that's been going on, I believe on NTV or something. And I listened to somebody who said that he worked for a bank. Things were too hectic. So he dropped out to go and do a master's. Now, if you can't handle the heat when you have an undergraduate degree, 
Will you be able to handle it when you have a master's? He's now doing a PhD while driving an Uber. And he says opportunities will present themselves after he gets his PhD. How do we even celebrate that? And then we claim to be the Silicon Savannah. We all brag about M-Pesa, which we never created. We just happen to be peculiar Kenyans who don't like to go home to the village. So instead of us going to the village, we want to send the money. And that's it. M-Pesa didn't work in Uganda. Why? Because Ugandans love to go home. M-Pesa hasn't worked in South Africa. Why? Because they have credit cards. It's not a global phenomenon. It's a peculiarity of a people. So do you understand your people? Do you understand the peculiarity of the Kenyan? You're Kenyan, so you should. So do you know the problems we have, we encounter on a daily basis? Have you identified some? After you've identified it, are you looking for a solution to that problem? Or have you just decided that, oh, I'll go out and start printing t-shirts or I'll start selling uh, things online. I want to go and do e-commerce. Uh, e-commerce is, is hockey. That's what it's been reduced to. Why do you need a four-year degree to go online and sell things? That is where the issue lies. So for those of you who are here because you're chasing after the whole price, Sorry, there's nothing as bad as chasing after grants at your prime. The worst thing is if we get it, it'll be what makes your life miserable forever. Internally, you need to create the relationships on campus with the people who will end up being your partners when you grow your business. That has been the norm for centuries. It's not new. Let's stop trying to think we can recreate this wheel. This wheel has been cast in concrete. It's round and that's it. So when you look at entrepreneurship, I hate the idea that we keep confusing it with being a startup. An entrepreneur is a guy who goes to open a kiosk. A startup is run by somebody who is trying to solve a problem that has not been solved. Now, any idiot, my friends, can be an entrepreneur. You go to Gikomba, you buy secondhand shoes, you walk to Kenyatta Avenue, you put them on the floor, and you sell them. Miambili, 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 miambili. Done. You have risked capital, and you have made a profit. You're an entrepreneur. Period. Now, why spend four years to go and do exactly that? Why not live now? Then hopefully by the time your peers are graduating in two years, most likely we'll have a stall in Gikomba. So you'll have be at least two, three steps ahead of them. So identify the problems in any area. Many of you at the University of Nairobi, opportunity abounds. Many of you never show up for, for open, le open lectures. You know, you go in, I occasionally walk in to just go and listen to inaugural lectures. What are inaugural lectures? It is somebody giving you a summary of what research he has done and what he has found out. Once he has searched and found out, that's the easy part. How do you commercialize it? That's innovation. The team at Google did not come up with the algorithm. The fellows at, ACIP, at uh, Oracle, the principle of a relational database was done by a professor years back, but he could never turn it into a commercial product. It took almost 30 years for somebody else to see that concept and convert it into a project to mass produce. So while you're there, ask yourself, what research is going on on campus? Which of it can I take and convert into a product or to solve a problem? We are not doing it. 
Instead, many of you will sit there for four years, then come out after the four years to lament about how there are no jobs. Yet, the community, the taxpayer, the government spent money on you because the assumption was when you leave, you shall create jobs. The friends of yours you left in Form 4, they are hoping that by the time you come out, it is you they will come to for jobs. But today what's happening? You're the ones going to you, the fellows who dropped out in Form 4 to ask them for work. All because you don't understand you're a, solver, you're a problem solver. That's what that four years you're doing is for. The Hulse Prize just helps you to test your ability to do it. And even if you don't go into entrepreneurship as we think about it, remember that even as an employee, you are an entrepreneur. The question is, will you become an innovative one or will you just go in and follow what we call, just follow the process. Just go and do the same thing over and over again. Then 10 years down the road, you say you have 10 years experience, but if you talk to somebody like me, I'll tell you, chances are you have one year's experience repeated over 10 years. That's what we have. And that's why companies wake up and fire people. Today, the age of retirement in the corporate and world is 45. So you're going to leave campus at 25. If you get a job, you have 20 years of working. That's if you're lucky. That's if you transition. Today it is 45. 10 years ago it was 55. So for those of you who do mathematics, this is a half-life. What do you think it will be in 10 years? People will be getting sent home at 35. Unless you can reskill. The same will apply to your business. If you start a business, it is only valid for the first three or four years. After that, there'll be competition that comes in. There'll be change of regulations. What you thought was a, was a unique skill becomes a standard skill. I used to, 20 years ago, I used to sell computers. Today, I walk into the supermarket and they are selling computers. Now, imagine if my business was just to think that selling computers was where the money was. It's a commodity today. Everything at some point turns into a commodity. And unless you keep on innovating, unless you keep on learning, when something turns into a commodity, you're finished. It just wipes you out. And let me tell you, it does not take months or years. It's sudden. You wake up one morning, and what you thought was your core business has ceased to be a business. People used to sell fax machines. I don't know if any of you know about that. People used to sell phone booths. People used to operate Simuya Jamis. People used to operate cybers. What has happened to that business? When I got my first mobile phone, I think it was 95, 96. I used to pay 35 shillings a minute. Today you're paying two shillings a minute and I keep hearing guys complaining. Oh, too expensive. To me, there's nothing expensive. It is so cheap. I do not see why I should not talk as much as I want. I talk and talk and talk on my phone. And my bill doesn't even get to a tenth of what it used to be in 97. Now imagine if Safaricom can bring down the price from 35 shillings a minute to two shillings a minute and still make money, what happened? They went for scale. What we don't do. We start a business and it, becomes, it remains a small business for the rest of our lives. Scale is what you're looking for. So Faricom looked at scale and how do you do scale? Bring down the price, bring down the cost of the product and triple, increase the turnover 10 times, 100 times. And while you keep scaling down, you keep killing competition. Ask yourself, Telcom have been unable to catch on. Why? Because they never understood what their business was. They didn't understand who their customer was. 
Airtel. Changed names how many times? Four times? And still the same problem. All why? Because none of them got to understand the Kenyan. The Kenyan is a peculiar animal. Michael Joseph understood us. And we called us peculiar, we complained. But it's a fact. It's only in Kenya where somebody pays more on mobile phone than for rent. Just ask yourself, who would spend more money on airtime than rent? Only a Kenyan, no one else. A peculiar Kenyan. But what it tells you is that there, it's an abundance of opportunity. Left, right, and center. If you serve the Kenyan right, they will give you whatever you want. Castle Breweries, those of you who ever looked at it, came here big with a lot of noise, part of unfair. We drank their samples and then we did not buy when they asked us to pay. We went back to Badayakazi, Burudikana. Yes, those who are old enough, Natasca. We love our alcohol, it has to be brewed locally. Here somebody tell about Heineken, I don't know what, but at the end of the day, Anarudi Nyumbani. Now, if somebody, people travel from elsewhere and come and understand us, why is it that we can't understand ourselves? The opportunity exists to make radical changes, radical improvements. But it will only happen if you understand that the four years that you were given were not for partying and socializing. It was an opportunity to open your minds. And after you open your minds, to use that new vision to identify problems that need to be solved. That's what you need to think about. So the why is there's only one reason why you're where you are. You're there to identify a problem that's big enough to solve and not to come up with a product then go looking for who can consume the product. Solutions looking for problems is our norm. It's the other way around. It is problems that must seek out solutions. If that's what you're planning to do, then following this program will help you. If all you're looking for is grant money, then I tell you it will be the most miserable thing about your life. If all you're looking for is to get a certificate at the end of this period or degree, then please understand the world is changing. Companies like Facebook, Google, P PwC, so all of the largest audit firms in the world, have now declared that a degree is no longer a requirement for entry. All they want to see is your aptitude. That is how they ascertain if they will give you a job. So what will you go out and sell now? When somebody has told you that the journey you're going along, when you get to the end, no one is interested in you. It'll be nothing more than a piece of paper. And that's the reality, not only for you at the University of Nairobi, not only for you in Kenya, it's the reality for the university student in the US, it is the same for university student in China, Everywhere around the world, it's no longer about whether you have a piece of paper, it's about whether you, you're able to apply yourself to solving an existing problem. Thank you very much. Back to you, George. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. And uh, for the insights, I think uh, you've really spoken volumes in terms of changing the minds of uh, our young people. I can see smiles for those who I can see. Uh, very good insights on balancing problems and solutions. You know, we may tend to think we have solutions, but solutions are not moving yeah, because we even don't know we have the problems in the first uh, place. Uh, this problem of chasing grants, I think you need to say that again, yeah, because you know the kind of young people we work with, they are mainly 
you know, chasing grants, you know, from this program, you know, I mean, start a proper today, hard price tomorrow, you know, they don't concentrate on building uh, the business, yeah, in quotes, you know, for sustainability. Very, very important insights, and uh, I want to see whether there are any questions coming in. I don't see questions in the chat. I think people want to ask questions. Yeah, there is one. Uh, yes, let me read it out, and this one is from uh, Julie Tuluch. With the rapid changes in the country today, does it mean that only entrepreneurship is going uh, to be the best possible option? Yeah, Robert, I know from your end, you can also see the question. Uh, so the others which are echoing the sentiments, very true. Yeah, maybe you can start by answering uh, that one before we have another round. I believe I answered that question. Everyone is an entrepreneur. So entrepreneurship has always been the only way. So this is nothing new. It's only that for some time we decided to abdicate and you go and you want to be employed and you, you don't want to be responsible for how you get paid. You just want to show up at eight o'clock and leave at five. Even though most of it, all you did was read the newspaper. Today you have social media. If you're told to turn off your phones, you start saying your employer is a bad person. No, I pay you to work for me from eight to five not to update your status. That's what business is about. If you want me to pay you for two hours, then come for two hours and go away. So entrepreneurship needs to be understood. It's your risk, financial, what is it? Financial uh, risk. You may take financial risk in the hope of profit. What's the profit? You went to school. That was how you were making the financial risk. You studied for five four years. Others will study for six. Others will study for seven. Where are you expecting to get the profit? When you go out and sell the skill. That's what we are. We are all entrepreneurs. So let's stop thinking that this entrepreneurship is something that sits in another realm. No, it does not. Because I get shocked when somebody tells me that the company suddenly closed. Companies don't suddenly close. The same way a woman doesn't just suddenly give birth. She's pregnant for nine months. It shows. So if somebody says, I'll Zaku a gafla, how do you Zaku a gafla? That would be a miraculous birth. The same way a company doesn't just close overnight. There are signs, but you blind yourself to it. So for the issue of that question, on you're all entrepreneurs. So stop thinking that you're not. And the minute you do, all the best, you'll be on TV in another four years, five years, on a show about how you got a degree and now you're working in Umjengo, yet your degree was in engineering. Chief, engineering is done in Umjengos. So you have a job in the area of your training. And then we go and publicize it. So it's, it's annoyingly frustrating that you can put somebody on a TV screen to tell you how he cannot apply the skill that he took five years to acquire. Okay, George, what other one? Yeah, so thank you, thank you very much. Let me read a couple. There's one that uh, the problem with innovation in business is fear of venturing to the unknown due to unexpected risks that may arise, also lack of resources. I think uh, that's a comment and uh, you mentioned that. There's one that uh, maybe you'll take time on how does one effectively build a product with a customer? I think it should be, how does one effectively build a product with a customer in mind? Yeah, so you will answer that, but let me read a, a couple more. Uh, the other one is, uh, okay, that's a comment, very productive talk. Uh, how can one be able to assess the magnitude of risks before venturing into business? Yeah, how can one be able to assess the magnitude of risk before venturing into business? Uh, yeah, so let me, let me, the third one, and then you answer those ones first is, how do you really customize your product to fit the customer? So it's around the same. Yeah, how do you customize your product to fit the customer? And if you feel you can take uh, maybe one more, uh, can you work backwards in entrepreneurship? like starting with the product first 
I think uh, they just don't understand that. <laughs> so maybe you can answer those ones and then I come with another round. So members continue putting questions in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. George, uh, you know, I'm wondering if most of you are actually listening to me. And this is the danger of a free webinar. People should be made to pay. You see, why do you want to start? How do you start with a product? How? You're a hawker. And even then, you'll not see a hawker picking up an item that does not have a market. You don't just pick up an item blindly, then you walk around to see if anybody wants it. No business should ever begin with a product. Every business, note, every business must begin with a customer. And I've repeated, I'll repeat again, even you sitting in the university studying, you're acquiring a product, sadly. Question, is there a customer for your product? If there's no customer for your product, then you're coming, going to finish and just walk the streets or end up at Safaricom customer service call center with a degree in your pocket. Why? Because you have not yet identified the customer who you want to go and provide a solution to. Please, I will repeat this. I hope it sinks in. There is no other way to do it. You must identify the customer, identify the problem the customer has, Make sure the customer is aware of the problem. If the customer is not aware of the problem, stop it. Only after you, the customer confirms to you they are aware of the problem, then start working on a solution. Actually, Mr. Point, before you even start on a solution, ask them if they want the problem fixed. If they don't want the problem fixed, then there is no need to look for a product. Don't try and build a solution. And finally, are they willing you to pay you to solve the problem? If I'm not interested in paying you to solve the problem, stop looking for a solution for the problem. Unless you're, an, you're a charitable organization, who are just doing it as a social enterprise activity. But if you're doing it to earn a living, somebody must be willing to pay you. And I'll only pay you if you're solving a problem I won't solve. Okay. Risk. You, you've taken a bigger risk. You're sitting in an institution of learning for four years, hoping that when you leave, there will be a job. Government has just frozen employment. No new hiring. Anymore. I've already told you that most companies have chopped down staff. I mean, the IT space. In the 90s, I was party to getting people called back office employees in banks to lose their jobs. Why? Because we moved three activities that used to happen in the back office and we brought it to the cashier in the front. And that was it suddenly banks were able to reduce their staff by a third. 10 years later, they reduced it by another third. So risk is something you live with on a daily basis. What you do is you do not reduce risk, you mitigate against risk. Insurance is a mitigation against risk. It's not a reduction of risk. Risk is like friction. For those of you who understand your physics, without friction, nothing happens. If I remove the friction, you're done. Friction and risk are the same. There must be an element of risk. And the higher the risk, the higher the return. Safaricom came and gave us mobile phones. Was it a risk? Yes. Why? Because we were used to landlines who are used to standing in phone booths. But what's the return they are getting today? The most profitable company in Sub-Saharan Africa, south of the Limpopo or something. That is where opportunity lies, in the risk. No risk, no return. 
Somebody mentioned, like I said, customer in mind, that is critical. Listen to all the noise going on now about NCBA. Everybody just screaming about how bad customer service is, how bad customer service is. Because they merged and they forgot that at the end of the day, what was important was the customers at the other end. That's what mattered. Not how bigger a bank it is with its asset base and the rest. No. The customer still remains at the core of any enterprise. Without the customer, then there's nothing you're doing. Lastly, resources. I hear people talking about resources. Resources are here. You're not going to dig a quarry. You're supposed to be what we call knowledge-based workers. So what do I mean by knowledge-based? Why do you need resources for knowledge-based economy? It's about you thinking. So you want to be paid to think? Then we have a problem. If that is what you're thinking, then we have a serious problem as a country. Resources, we want to be funded. For what? For thinking. For coming up with an idea. Oh, people will steal my idea. Ideas are a dime. You know how much is a, di is a dime? A dime is 12 bob. So if it's a dime a dozen, so every idea is how much? One bob. So which idea of this one of yours we think is more than one bob? It's one shilling. Until you execute it. Once you're able to execute the idea, then it acquires value. So long as it remains just an idea, its value now I've told you is not zero. You've used brain cells, is one shilling. One Kenyan shilling. So that those 200 brilliant ideas you have, that's two reds. Go by airtime. I believe I've answered the questions. Yes, thank you very much. And I see, Julia Toluot, you have your hand up. Uh, you want to ask a question directly? Over to you, Juliet. Before I read others, and I'm happy we have so many questions coming in. Robert, you'll answer so many questions. You need to prepare. Juliet, you want to come on? And mute your mic and come on. But anyway, let's continue with this. Uh, so the other question is kindly discuss the role of the government in providing an enabling environment for entrepreneurs to flourish. And I, I have unmuted uh, my mic. Yes, yes, Juliet, you can come on. Thank you. Thank you so much for this um, productive meeting. I would love to ask uh, Dr. Robert Yawe. You see, I could have a brilliant idea and I'm just going to base my argument on halt price. And um, we, only ha we can only have one winner. So if my idea does not win and it's clearly something that can be implemented, what can you advise me on such? Like what can I do? Because if the idea requires me to have resources in terms of financial finance. Um, so what, what would you advise me to do? Should I just let it die because I didn't get the grant? And there's also wonders against depending on grants. So what is the way forward for such a person? Or which, um, where can we take the idea so that at least it can be implemented? Thank you. Thanks, Juliet. Uh, as I said, ideas are a dime a dozen. And until they're executed upon, they have no value. If you're waiting for the grant for the to win the the challenge so that you can execute, then I'm I'm sorry that you're going to it's going to be very disappointing. Because already I think you have about 400 people who will apply for this grant. So your chances are one in 400. And that's where the issue really lies. Can you go out and look for a a problem that needs you can solve? with as little as possible. If possible, if you can only solve it by your knowledge, the better. But basing your idea on how much is going to be awarded is actually counterproductive. Okay, Juliet? 
Yeah, thank you. I think in case of uh, more questions, Juliet will come back on. Thank you for that. Uh, so maybe, Robert, you take another few. We have around 18 messages, so let me try to be uh, efficient. Kindly discuss the role of government in providing an enabling environment for entrepreneurs to flourish. I think I mentioned that. Uh, the other one is, I have a big, brilliant idea. It is going to be a game changer, but I'm afraid of it being stolen. You know, the innovation. <laughs> but it's important to address this because this is a problem, Robert. So. I think you need to tackle that. Uh, so the other one is, Robert, is social entrepreneurship worth in East Africa than business entrepreneurship? Very good question. Uh, the other one is, I found the topic too important, especially to us first years. It should have been compulsory to first years. It enlightens, it gives knowledge. Okay, that one I think will go to the university. Uh, the other question is, how many times should you iterate the product before uh, product market fit? Yeah, which is a good question. And then the other one is, uh, how do you make sure you do not lose sight of your customer for perhaps a higher paying crowd? Uh, we are building social enterprises, but what if you have found a high income solution which might undermine the issue and the customer? Uh, the other one is, uh, what would you advise someone who has a brilliant idea but no resources to execute? And I think you touched on that uh, when you're answering the other one. Uh, then there is, what then can such a person do in terms of uh, if you are depending on grants? I think the question is, I appreciate the fact that he has clearly advised us again is depending on grants. So what would you advise them to do so that they don't become uh, perennial you know, seekers of grants? <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, maybe you want to take those ones first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Government enabling environment. The government has already provided a substantially enabling environment. One, you're sitting in an institution of learning that has been funded by the government. Two, you have a safe environment in which to operate. Three, Government is always trying to give you resources to do what you want to do, but many of us have refused to do even proposals which are two pages long. For me, the person who has done everything that is logically possible to do is called the government of Kenya. They haven't hired me to make this statement. This is not a sponsored message. Uh, it is a reality on the ground. Go to, if you're doing product research, there's Kirdi. If you want funding for that, there's KIE. There's Mesea, micro and small enterprise agency. Leather, there's a whole leather industry. Textile, you've seen what the president is now wearing. Local materials. But have you people, people who are doing, people at ADD, have they gone to try and present designs to, to Rivertex? No. Why? They are sitting in Nairobi waiting for what grants? To do what? To get trips to Europe. Seriously. Government has solved all your problems. All you need to do is wake up and do something. We cannot. You've been given manna from heaven. It has fallen on the ground. You're calling God to come with a basket. You're calling God to give you somebody to put the manna from the floor into the basket. You want God to put food into your mouth. Seriously? The government is doing nothing to support us. If the government supports you anymore, they will need to carry you on their backs. Literally. Thank you. You have a big, brilliant idea. That is all it is, a brilliant idea. Until you execute it, it is of no value to you or anyone else. So go out and execute. And stop telling me how there are no resources. Unless you're telling me you've found a way to build a new nuclear plant. And even then, if you put it together, we have something called KIPI. who will allow you to license, to register your IP. And they do not steal ideas at Kipi, please. They don't steal ideas. They are too busy doing other things. So if you think your idea is brilliant enough and what you need is to register it, then go and register it. Get the IP. But again, don't forget that 90% of IPs never get commercialized. So just because you have an IP does not mean you now have a commercially viable product. Chances are you might just get an IP which will help somebody else to build something. And I tell you, anybody with those ones, go read about the history of penicillin. The fellow who discovered penicillin 
never com did not commercialize it. Why? He did not have the chemical, the chemistry skills or the engineering skills to be the centrifuge to be able to grow it. The bacteria that produces the penicillin you use today is not the one that killed, he found in his lab. He identified a concept. Other people commercialized the concept. I'll give you an example. Most people don't know that Elon Musk did not found Tesla. Elon Musk found two professors who discovered how to make a battery more efficient and a motor for an electric car. But they were academicians. They were doing research. They needed a man who needed, knows how to do business. So walk in Elon Musk and what did he do? Made the millionaires and threw them out. So for you people with your brilliant ideas, at some point, somebody will kick you out of that business and don't complain. Just rub your back as you walk away and move on. If, you're good, if, you, if you have so many brilliant ideas, go get another one. Social enterprises, every enterprise is a social enterprise. Why? It serves a community. Even Kalashnikov, who came up with a Kalashnikov gun. He ran a social enterprise. The gun allowed societies to be stable because somebody with a gun standing on the other end made you think twice before you came out with a knife. M-Pesa is a social enterprise. But once you've made profit, then you form a foundation. And then you do CSR. You cannot start an organization based on CSR. How many people does Safaricom employ? Let's look at M-Pesa. I'm told there are what, 135,000 M-Pesa agents? So that's how many employees? How many business people? 135,000. How many shops now have a tenant? 135,000 plus. So how many people has M-Pesa empowered and enabled? Hundreds of thousands, if not millions. So what is M-Pesa? It's a social enterprise. So the minute you start thinking NGO, listen, don't think NGO. NGO is not a social enterprise. It's CSR from somewhere, Ford Foundation, Rockefeller, Safaricom Foundation. After they have charged you four bob per call, they take five cents and they put it in the foundation to go and do things that don't need to make money today, but they need to make money down the road. So please do not lie to yourselves that you're being done a favor by a so-called social enterprise. No. I just need to keep people alive long enough for them to become profitable for you. So social enterprise noise, any enterprise is a social enterprise. Iterations, you iterate until it fits into the market. I don't know if any of you is a carpenter. Now I was trained as a fundi wambao. There's what we call a mortis and a tenon. You render the tenon until it fits into the mortis. Not an inch more. You must. Or if it's metallic, you file and file and file until it fits. You can't have a nut that is big, a, a screw that is bigger than the nut, and you tell me that it is now ready to fit. No. You must. Tapper it until it's the same size as the teeth on the nut. This is not rocket science. And you can't run out. And I think if those of you who are biblical, somebody asked, how many times should I forgive my brother? 70 times how many? Yes. Now you iterate until the market fits. So don't ask me for numbers. These things are not cast in stone. Environments are different. Safaricom has tried to launch M-Pesa three times. How many times? One, two, three in South Africa. And it has failed how many times? One, two, three. They are going for number four. Why? Because every time you iterate, you learn. If you don't learn, then there's no need of iterating. And I'll ask you, whenever you got your exam paper, which questions did you go and revise? The ones you got right or the ones you got wrong? 
Anybody who revised the ones they got right, put up your hand. I'm sure none. So every failure is a learning opportunity. So don't dismiss failure. Failure is only wasted when nothing is learned. You cannot learn to ride a bicycle without falling down. Every scar on your foot, on your head, on your hand. For those of you who still who rode bicycles when young, I'm sure you can give me a story of every single injury you got from learning to ride. Today, you're a good bicycle cyclist because you fell down. So iterate and iterate until the market, your product fits the market. Lose sight of the customer. Please never lose sight of the customer. The minute you do, you'll be run over. Because somebody else is targeting that customer. We say that the person who used to be the biggest ice manufacturer is not the one who came up with the refrigerator. Why? He lost track of the customer and he got obsessed with the product. So the minute you become obsessed with your product, expect to get disrupted. Funding, 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 funding. Somebody spends 200 bob on airtime every day. But they're looking for funding of 10,000 shillings to try a business strategy, business idea. It's called deferred gratification. Save, 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 and see what to do. The first money you put into your startup is your money, not other people's money. Get friends. Jack Ma got 21 friends. How many? Two, one. 21 friends to start Alibaba. Why? Because they were able to pull together. Unfortunately, many of us still have our primary school thinking whereby you do an exam as an individual. In the business world, you cannot survive as an individual. You must build teams that will work together to achieve the objective. Now, if you keep chasing funding, it's because you're a selfish person who does not want to share the benefits. So stop being selfish and start sharing. George. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we still have a lot of questions for you. Uh, so we have around ten minutes, nine minutes in terms of time, but uh, I know you'll do a good job in answering them. Uh, the the first one is uh, in terms of how do we really get to know the problems of the customers? You know, what can we do? You know, what methodology can we employ to be able to know that? Uh, the other one is how do you maintain market relevance? Let me try to really summarize them. The around uh, yes, yes. So, uh, so let me come up with others. Uh, there is a call for you to share your phone number. Uh, so <laughs> you take note of that. Uh, so, what can you contribute uh, to the shared messages on WhatsApp instead of just asking them to forward? Okay, so that I think is for us here. Uh, more informed now, comments. What if you can't get the like-minded people to work with as a team? Uh, I think uh, that comes into your last uh, comment that you just made. Uh, so there is one about time I think I need to highlight. Uh, so we are making them reach without even, uh, I think this is this is good. So maybe you can just answer those and then uh, we can come in closing. I'm not seeing any other hands. Uh, most of them are comments actually. So just answer those two, sir. Thank you. We ask ourselves, what was Mark Zuckerberg thinking about when he came up with Facebook? He needed to find out where all the hot chicks on campus, which causes they attend so that he could show up and look for chicks. So he was suffering from the typical male problem of testosterone. Today, he's running a multi-billion <laughs> shilling business by trying to solve <laughs> a problem that all men suffer with at some point. You're usually the first one to experience the problem. 
the first, the best person to solve a problem is the one who has it. So nothing stops you from being your first customer. Too many of us are trying to look for something from like a genie. You know, you want to rub this kettle and a genie comes up and gives you three wishes. It doesn't work. If you look around you, there are problems left, right, and center. You just need to become more observant and stop spending your time looking down at a phone at messages which are going nowhere. I grew up in a time of landlines, whereby when the phone rang, if it's somebody disconnected, you'd never know who tried to call you. Today, I believe you all have a call log. Eh? So why is it that people are so obsessed with picking up their phones everywhere, in church, on the streets, everywhere? The mindset, or was it ingrained? Your parents' need for landlines it was, got internalized in you that you fear that if you don't pick up a phone, your life will come to an end. No, it doesn't. You just go back and you look and you'll see it. There's a log. It shows you who tried to call you and how many times they tried to call you. So look around you. Opportunities abound. Problems are everywhere. Everywhere. You just need to stop looking at those little small screens which are distracting you from what is happening around you. Remove those headphones and listen in to what's being said around you. That's all you need. Every single business you talk about out there that's grown big was somebody solving a problem for themselves. Amazon was he was having a problem finding the right books at the right price delivered to him. And that's where it starts. That's where you begin. And you solve a smaller problem, which then grows and becomes a bigger problem. And solve a bigger problem. And look around you. Look at Safaricom. Safaricom did not start with six. The, I think they have like 40 products now. They didn't start with 40 products. They started with a single product. Phone calls. Only. Nothing else. SMS came later. Sadly, for many of you, you don't understand what I'm talking about. We used to have telephones which did not send messages. You could only make a call and receive a call. That was it. Because the problem they were solving was voice communication. Today, you have WhatsApp calling. You have, oh, then you have now back to the one we used to have, which was callback. Eh? I didn't know that callback will come back. After you people did call, please call me for so long, Safari Cobra to find a solution. So the company grows from just like a tree, from a seed. You deal with a core problem, and then that core problem, once you solve it for your customer, the next problem presents itself, and you solve that one, and you solve the next one, and you solve the next one, and you solve the other one. Finally, they gave you M-Pesa, which does what? Stops what we call churn. Now you can't run away from Safaricom. Because if you run away from Safaricom, no M-Pesa. That is how you lock in your customers. But continue to provide them with improvement in service. Market relevance. You remain relevant in the market so long as you're solving the customer's problem. The minute you stop solving the customer's problem, you become irrelevant. The phone booth ceased to solve the customer's problem. And it died. M-Pesa is making banks irrelevant. Because banks thought that business of banking is about a, a, a building. It's not about a building. It's about a level of convenience. People say M-Pesa is expensive, and I ask, do you know what the, the price of the cost of the alternative is? I'll give you a simple example. You need to send money to your friend in Rongai, and you're in, and you're in, in Thika. Assume there was no M-Pesa. How much will it cost you to get the money to him? A matatu from Thika to town, a matatu from town to Rongai is how much? 100 bob plus 50 bob. Then you go back home, 100 bob plus 50 bob. How much is that? 300 shillings, eh? To go and take your friend 1,000 bob. How much is it by M-Pesa? 
to send a thousand bob? 27 shillings. So is 27 shillings cheap or expensive? Cheap. cheap. Especially when you factor in the time. Yes. So I keep hearing people showing up here. You know, m is too expensive. I'm looking for a solution which is cheaper. Cheaper for who? I've not complained. No one has complained. So why are you trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist? Perceived problem. Don't solve perceived problems. Solve real problems. So I think I've answered the two questions. One last yes, one. Yes. Uh, is there any other question maybe? I don't see any other. Yeah, so uh, I maybe want to thank you, Robert, for doing a very, very good job. I've also learned, uh, yes, I've also learned a lot. And uh, I think I'll be attending more of these sessions. I don't mind uh, being invited when I have time. Uh, yes, uh, back to the organizers of this. Thank you very much. Oh, Welcome. Thanks a lot, Dr. Oh, Dr. George and also Robert Yawe. We really appreciate for your time and all the insights and I hope everyone has been challenged. Yeah, you are talking the campus director is saying that he's really, he has really been challenged. And I, I recall one of the participants saying that uh, I'd really, that he'd really advise those who are participating not to just look at the price, but now let them be challenged on how now to change their perspective and not just look at the price only. And thanks a lot and we really appreciate uh, for your time. And uh, I'd, I'd like to invite our campus director to just give a, a vote of thanks. Mwati, are you around? Uh, sure, I'm here. Uh, just to uh, uh, thank a lot, uh, Mr. Robert Yawe. I know uh, you've really taken your time to actually even prepare and even consider talking to the students. Remember last year I was a participant in Halt Prize. And I remember one of the times uh, during the finals when we were pitching and, uh, you know, you are among the judges and you asked us so tough questions until when we, <laughs> we gathered together as a team uh, for the three to, uh, we were three actually in our team. And we, when we came out of the competition, we were like, wait, who was that? You know, and uh, because we are asked so tough questions until we, we couldn't even have answers in front of the judges. So I just want to encourage each and every one of us. These are the kind of judges you will meet uh, for the competition. So don't think it will be an easy journey. Uh, we want to have the best team representing the University of Nairobi, but also most importantly, we also want all of us to actually learn in terms of being innovators, and entrepreneurs. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Tari. Thank you so much, Dr. George. That was um, a, a good facilitation. And I know that uh, you'll send our regards even uh, back to Kenyatta University. Thank you so much, Makedi. I hand over back to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Mwati. And uh, yeah, for those who, who, are, who didn't come in when, while I was introducing myself. My name is Makid Diabanas. I'm your team's coordinator. And from the team's deck, we have so many teams, so many teams, and we really appreciate for your application. And through this time, uh, till, till now, 24th of October, when we'll be having the, now the quarters, then we move to the semis, we really want to challenge you and widen your, uh, your scope on, on how you think about entrepreneurship and startups. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's from my desk. And now I want to welcome my co-facilitator, Grace Kamau, you know, to tell us more about what, what is, is, is she planning for us as Halfrise UOM. And as she also uh, gives, uh, and also, uh, as she also prays for us. But before Kamau comes in, uh, I think Moti has something to say. Moti, yeah, can you proceed? Yeah, I just want to uh, appreciate, also we have... Uh, the community builder for Kenya, who actually works in tandem with all the other campuses in the region. You realize that we have a number of universities participating globally. So I would want to take this opportunity to ideally welcome Jolene. Jolene, if you can hear me. I hope she's still around. We, uh, we had communicated at some point in time. Jolene, could you unmute yourself? Okay, okay. Um, if she's not around, then we can we can call it a session. 
Hi, John. Okay, okay, thank you. Hi, hi. You could say hi. You could say hi to this uh, amazing team. Hi, thank you so much um, for the invite. Um, this has been such an informative session. Thank you so much to um, Dr. George Kosimbe and uh, Robert Yawe for uh, the session that we've just had. It's very exciting for me to see young people um, excited to change the societies in which they live in. It's, um, it's such an exciting journey for me. I started Health Prize about two years ago and to see how much it has grown in our country and in our campuses is such a huge joy for me. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing the exciting ideas that will come from the University of Nairobi this year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Back to Makedi. Okay, thanks a lot, Mwati. And can you, Grace, can you proceed and as you finish, as you do wrap <laughs> for, for us the meeting today? Grace? All right. Um, I would first like to say a few of my highlight points um, from our speakers. Um, one was, did the ice maker invent the refrigerator? It's just challenging us to kind of reach further and to really, really look out for our pro the problems in our customers and to try and reach them as best as we can. I'm so grateful for learning um, what I've learned through this session. And I really, really thank our speakers, Dr. Yahweh and um, George, that you know they made time to come and talk to us and to inspire us as University of Nairobi students. It definitely shows that you know we're thought of. It definitely makes us feel more significant. And you know, just having such words to inspire your startups and what you're doing is so important. And it's literally something that you should really take seriously. Um, another thing I wanted to add that maybe some of you might not know, if you, um, if you feel like this competition, if you do not make it to the end of the competition, do not give up on your dreams, do not give up on your projects because there is someone who will identify it. Like we said, um, Halt Prize wasn't identified, like they didn't pick you and tell you that you would sign up. But I'm telling you, there's so many people that are willing to listen to you and so many people that are willing to take your ideas on board. All right, I think that's the end. Um, my name is Grace Kamau. I am a petroleum engineering student at the University of Nairobi, and I really hope you enjoyed this. Our next webinar is on Wednesday. It's ethics in business. And like I had said earlier, um, we'll be talking about integrity and how to really um, treat the people that work for you to, you know, just as human beings with dignity and with pride and how to be humble and be a good uh, founder. I'd like to pray. Um, yes, I'd like to pray first and then uh, we can depart the webinar. Um, let's close our eyes for a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for an amazing session we had today. Thank you that we were able to, you know, get internet, get a laptop, get a phone, get a device to be able to listen to what we had listened to today. Thank you for putting the words and the inspiration and the spirit into our speakers of the day. Thank you that they were able to impact greatly in our lives. And oh Lord, as they go on with their journeys and their days, please bless them abundantly for as they have blessed us <laughs> abundantly. So help them with anything that they're working on, help them in their businesses and help their families, dear God. Um, thank you that we we're able to have as many participants as we have had today. We do not take this for granted and we do not take this opportunity for granted. Thank you for the health prize and thank you that we're able to come towards a common cause such as this. And Lord, as we depart this webinar, please give us um, enough blessings and enough spirit to continue with our ideas and be the best we can be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'll hand thank this back you. to Makedi and he will wrap this up. Thank you, yeah, everyone. Thanks a lot for that, Grace. And everyone know we, are, we want to have a photo session. You know, online online webinars now gives us a platform where we have now, I say online or uh, online what online online photo sessions. So I'd request all of us now to have our videos on. Let me allow you. Yeah, let me allow you guys to have your videos on. Just a moment. Nice. Yeah, let's have our videos on so that we can have a photo session. You can now smile, or you can say cheese. Yeah, it's good to see you, and uh, we are welcoming you back to for the Wednesday webinar. Yeah, kindly, it's still free. It's still free, so even though it's free, yeah, you'll just have to concentrate, as Yahweh said. Kindly, don't don't take the webinars 
to be so so free so that and you don't concentrate so much yeah so that that that's it and thanks a lot for coming today and have a blessed evening thank you and bye-bye thank you thank you very much yeah thank you Yahweh and george yeah thank you <laughs>